for medical science without um, the production of new data or the, the access to existing data. Very, very little scientific advance is made. Uh, and typically studies will do a combination of those two things. And so uh, around the world, there are many databases, as Jeff has already, um, already told us, that are important for people, uh, arguably in, in, indispensable for people to make advances in their science. And, and the GBC is all about trying to address the, uh, the challenges associated with the, the sustainability of these databases. So if we move to the next slide, please. So what, what, I'll, what I'll do is um, just talk a little bit about the infrastructure that these data resources collectively make up. Um, I'll talk about the challenge of sustainability. I'll introduce the GBC. I'll give some examples of things that the GBC is doing, and then I'll finish up with a, a comment on why I think this matters to biodiversity scientists and to biodiversity informatics scientists as well. And so the, oh, here we are. the um, uh, collectively, there are some 3,000 data resources that make up this global infrastructure. But unlike um, most other scientific infrastructures, if you think of telescopes, you think of uh, particle accelerators, um, unlike other infrastructures, they, these grow from the bottom up. They come from the community organically and they grow. And, and often, as we heard before, you know, a lab gets interested in a particular or gets, develops a technique, produces a new data type, builds its own database. It has collaborators that need access to the database. And over time, there are more and more collaborators and it becomes a really important service. And actually, for some of the biggest databases that we now have that we use day in, day out, uh, they've taken this, this, this path as well. So... It's crucial. It's a highly, um, uh, highly organic infrastructure. It exists really around the world. Um, it's, it's highly distributed. No one actually knows exactly where all the components are. That's, as we'll see, that's part of our job to, to try to find that out. Um, and it's very open. And the openness is really important because it allows different parts of the infrastructure to be connected. So typically, the data resources don't exist in isolation. Data will flow, or there'll be connections, there'll be cross-references, there'll be language, vocabularies used in one that are, that, are, that, are, that are common to the other. So there's a huge connectivity. And so we see this as an ecosystem of databases and services. Um, it's, I probably don't need to even mention this here, that it's cost-effective. There are many examples of where it's just not possible to collect data, to rerun experiments, uh, and, and the searchability and the reusability that you get with stored data just exceeds that you get with living things in, in, in living in real environments. Um, uh, and there's a lot of opportunity because we, we um, the, the data science is becoming, well, life science is becoming more data intensive uh, and data science methods are becoming more and more powerful. So there's a great deal we can do, but we need this to grow. We need this to be sustained in order to realize these benefits. So on to the next. Next slide, please. And so um, there are some significant challenges. Uh, so um, the rate at which people produce data increases, typically with a rate that itself increases. So often we see exponential growth in some of the data types that feed the databases. Uh, we all love open access, uh, and more and more institutions, funders, journals adopting open access policies. This is all great, but of course, it increases the demand on the system. Uh, the data resources need to be there to handle the, fl the greater flows of data. Um, we have loads of new technologies coming along all the time. Uh, there needs to be a home for the data. These need services. Um, and, and as I mentioned, data science, think of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on, really powerful. Um, but they place a huge demand on the data resources to be able to serve their purposes. Um, so uh, there are um, challenges due to the way that this, is, this infrastructure has grown organically. Um, there's no top-down coordination. Um, it's grown. Actually, it suits purpose in many ways very well. So we don't want to start putting in some kind of control point at the top. But it means that globally, um, there's been no coordination between countries, between the funders of life science research uh, to, to, to run this as an infrastructure. And typically, lots of these, as we heard from, from, from Jeff in the, the Australian case, this is common to many parts of the world, to data resources in many parts of the world. Often, you know, really important databases are living on three, four, five-year uh, research grants as part of some other research activity. Um, no opportunity to plan, no opportunity to, 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 to procure the right kind of technical hardware or cloud provision, no, no, no strategic opportunity really to develop things for the, for the longer term. So um, if you look on the right there, just, just quickly. So this is a study from a few years ago now looking at some European, large European life science databases uh, in a particular set from the, the Elixir, which is the European infrastructure. They were asked the question in 2018, how many um, FTEs, how many people, how many um, uh, positions, staff positions do you have that are secured from the funding sources you have? How many people can you have running your 
your resource. And you see that up until 2018, which when we asked the question, um, it was 300. So this is for a collection of different data resources. So that's the steady state. But then the question was, well, what, what do you, what's secured for next year? What's secured for the following year and the following year? And you see that, that, that at the point in 2018, the window of security really was no more than three years. And, and there were no, no positions available. You know, you get five, six years in, very few positions have been secured. And so you can't plan with this, um, with this kind of situation where, where really your funding expires with no security about how you get the next round um, uh, within a three-year window. So on to the next slide, please. So the, the Global Biodata Coalition um, is a coalition of, of, uh, of life science funding organizations that come together really to recognize first how, how important this infrastructure is, these data resources are to the scientific progress, to delivering their programs. Second, that, that um, there are threats to the sustainability. The sustainability is low, there's fragility in the system, um, and that they need as funders to work together to address these challenges. And they come together, they um, agree, they sign up to a letter of understanding that really has them uh, supporting the work of a well, the small coordinating secretariat, but but really trying to work together to find the ways in which better global cooperation between funding organisations can happen, uh, better to sustain these data resources, and and essentially this is a job really of of bringing together communities of people that run the data resources. Uh, with communities of people that that know about and 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 run the funding, and then and finding the, the the middle point, finding the thing that the, the the model that will work for both sides, and then helping them to to move towards that model. So, on the next slide, please. So, currently, we have eleven different funding organisations uh, and observer organisations on a path to membership um, uh, from different parts of the world. So you see one, see a, a, a NHMRC in Australia. For example, we have um, a scientific advisory committee, we have various working groups, and I'll cover some of the work from those groups, and then we have a small group uh, working in the secretariat. So on the next slide, please. So on to some of the things that we've been doing. So this is the inventory that Jeff has already introduced very, very nicely. Um, so this was a process to try to identify where these data resources are. We can all think of the ones we use most often, um, but we know there are many that we were unlikely to know about. Um, so this was an approach that took the, the assumption that, well, if you are, a, um, if you are a, a data resource that's providing services and you're open and you want people to come and use your data resource, you will at some point publish a paper in the scholarly literature that describes your resource and invites people to come and look. Now, not everyone has done that, so we know we're missing. Uh, there are some false negatives in here because not everyone publishes or not everyone has published yet. Um, but through this process, um, and I won't go into the details of it, we revealed just over 3,000 different data resources. Um, and some of them are, are big and very generalist and in very, very heavy use all the time. Um, and then uh, there are some intermediates and there's a very long tail with some really focused and specialist data resources. So with this effort, we Partly we want to know what they are, but we want to know who, what kind of organizations are running them. We want to make contact with the people that are running them. Um, and we also want to understand how they're funded um, and, and possibly bring more funders into the loop and understand a little bit more about what the, the, the existing uh, models for funding are. Um, so just to point you there, hopefully the slides will be shared. A couple of um, uh, papers that have been submitted in preprint form that describe this inventory, and they also give the the whole of the, the workflow for, for reuse. And that was a bit of a feature is to make this an open, an open um, exploration in itself that can be reused. So onto the next slide, please. So a second uh, piece of work was to, um, on the understanding that there are um, a number of data resources that are really used, you know, the, the resources that are, we've heard mention of, of, of GenBank and GBIF, those data resources that are typically fairly generalist, but they're used very, very heavily and they have a truly global user base. Um, thinking that if those resources are not sufficiently sustainable, um, then they will not only, you know, the world will suffer because it won't have direct access, but actually that will impact a lot of the other data resources because typically they're feeding data or they're providing some 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 information into, into the, the slightly smaller, more specialist resources. Um, so we went through a selection process in 2022. Um, so we set a, a number of criteria. Um, I won't go through them in detail, but essentially we were trying to find these, 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 these bigger players um, that have a, a broader and, and global usage. Um, and we um, had a, a, a panel of expert, uh, external expert reviewers, um, a two-stage process. And um, at the end of that, we ended up with 37 uh, different, um, what we call global core biodata resources. And um, just to say an example would be, uh, well, there are many different types of data resources, and an example is, is GBIF. Um, and on the, 
final version of the slides. I think I had a picture of it, but that tells me this is not not the final version. Um, so um, another piece of piece that comes from that is that that we now have 37 different um, global core data by, by data resources, and we have the the teams and the, the leaders of those resources who uh, are keen to work together to to try to find solutions to sustainability. Um, and so uh, we've been speaking to to what we call the GCBR forum, that is these people, um, various topics of interest. One of the things we have to do is is to define, and I just show a mind map down here, and I don't expect you to see any of the be able to read the words, but just to show you that this is quite complex. Um, this is really trying to define sustainability. So we know that funding is important and, and it's it's the single point of failure. If you don't have sufficient funding, you can't run these things. Goodwill only gets you so far. Um, but it's funding alone isn't sufficient. There are all sorts of issues of of, of governance, of um, QC, integrity, um, political independence, um, sufficient, uh, the level of individual resources. And then when you from the funders' perspective, you want they typically want to think about you know agility of the whole of the ecosystem. What happens when there's a new data type? Can there be a data resource rapidly in place that allows people to make use of the data to share the data? Um, what happens when a methodology that's that's you've been really important becomes less important? You know how do you sunset that but but keep the data in some way but sort of expect that it's it's used to to a, to, a, to a lower extent? So. One of the functions of the GCBR forum through one of its working groups is to think about how you define sustainability. And, and that's an ongoing discussion and, and, and look out for, uh, I hope, publications on that. And on to the next slide, please. So another thing is a little bit more from the funder side. So we put together about a year ago, two working groups uh, made up of representatives of the different, different member and observer funders. Um, and they've had some really quite intense discussions about different issues. So one group is on um, sustainability. Um, that has looked at the, you know, what are the premises? Who's, who has a stake in, 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 in life science uh, data resources? Um, who, what are the premises? Who should be responsible for paying for this? And, and what are the principles? Um, uh, also asking questions about what sustainability means from the funder perspective. But in this case, also beginning to explore possible mechanisms. So mechanisms through which globally different funders of different types from different parts of the world can work together better to sustain these, these, these important data resources. Another group was working on open data strategies. Um, uh, and so that is the, the policy environment across the different funders that enables open data services to be provided. Uh, again, some really deep and interesting discussions. So two of these, uh, these two groups have come up with um, uh, quite well quite intense um uh, very detailed um but really uh interesting uh consultation papers so this is really a sort of these are statements of the lay of the land and the issues to think about these aren't really opinions at this point um and these are now out for consultation so from the beginning of last week we had a um we started the consultation and very much very much encourage people to um to to have a look at those papers and and, and feed into that process um and so the links are here the links are here and um uh, we uh, certainly want to hear from the biodiversity uh, informatics community on this. Um, ultimately, these will become white papers, and, and we hope they will steer a lot of the work that we do with GBC. On to the next slide, please. Um, so just really to wrap it up, um, so why bi biodiversity informatics? Why engage? Well, um, uh, people who, so people in this community are, are actually running often some of these data resources that, that, that matter here. Um, biodiversity scientists and biodiversity informaticians are consumers of these data resources that absolutely require them. Um, and, and actually for biodiversity, the access is probably fairly broad across all sorts of quite specific, but also the general data resources. So it's a good example of needing the whole of this ecosystem. So how to engage. So again, the links for the consultation process for the white papers, um, uh, have a look at the inventory. I'll put the direct link in here. If a data resource you care about or a data resource you manage isn't in the list, then let us know. We really want to know about it. Um, and um, even if it is in the list, do get in touch and tell us about it. And then on the next, actually skip, well, yeah, the next slide, please. So just to acknowledge the, I've acknowledged most of the people already. This is the secretariat on the final slide. These are the ways in which you can follow. On the next slide, please. These are the ways in which you can follow what we're doing. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, no, thanks, Guy. I think we'll go straight to the next talk, David Ickledon. 
uh, from Q will tell us about the Biodiversity Heritage Library. 